Kathleen. I'm pleased to, uh, to moderate this first session uh, this afternoon. And we have uh, slightly rearranged uh, the setting because we did not really believe it, I have to admit, uh, six weeks ago, but the Commission made it and they um, have presented uh, yesterday a uh, breathtaking new regulation on certain new genetic engineering technologies and if, as all of us are really excited about this since I think months, uh, I remember we were discussing this in November last year already, um, we have invited Claire Bury, the mother of this um, uh, regulation, so to speak, and the Deputy Director General of DG Sante, responsible for the food safety and sustainability um, aspects, to present this uh, brand new proposal of the Commission as regards NGT's new genomic techniques, I think, or new GMOs. And uh, the floor is yours, uh, Mrs. Uh, Bury. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you for coming and presenting this already for the third time this uh, today. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Hoisling asked me if I changed my mind since this morning, you know, in terms of what will be in the proposal. But I, I think I have to do a repeat of the performance that I've already done twice, as you say. Yeah? Um, but uh, I would like to say thank you for inviting the Commission. Um, I detect from the ironic tone in your voice that you're not necessarily that happy to see this proposal. Um, but I think it was clear from the discussions this morning that there are some quarters of the Parliament who have been waiting for this. Um, you all know as well as I do uh, the uh, challenges that we have on the Green Deal. Um, and that's why the Commission has come forward with a proposal and we are looking for this to be part of the answer on, on sustainability, of course. I mean, I think today we'll debate whether you think that's going to be the case or not and to what extent. Um, but I think as Vice President Timmerman said the other day, all the elements are now on the table if everybody wants to make progress on, on the Green Deal. So, first of all, um, hang on now, let's get to the... Uh, to the next one, okay. So this uh, slide just gives you uh, really a, a description uh, of what's in the proposal um, and what the overall objectives are. So as you know very well, the new genomic techniques uh, are innovative tools in terms of gene uh, breeding and changing. Um, I said this morning, and I think we all have a collective responsibility in this respect in terms of communicating around this proposal, uh, that there are differences compared to GMOs. Nobody's doubting that there is the overarching category of GMOs, uh, but for us, biologically, these are different because it doesn't involve using foreign DNA from another organism and bringing it in. Um, there are different techniques, and the assessment that the Commission's made, and we did this because the Member States asked us to look, uh, at the existing framework uh, is that it's not really fit for purpose because it doesn't, um, it doesn't correspond to the biology of these techniques and nor does it correspond in terms of being able to take account of the risk assessment that needs to be done for them. So on the right hand side you'll see that we've tabled a proposal which still has very much high protection of health and the environment as the starting point. Uh, we have scientific advice from EFSA but not only. Uh, again, uh, um, we have to see, of course, what's going to happen in practice, and I would accept there's not a lot of evidence out there yet, but there is some evidence. Uh, but we've tried to build in uh, some aspects of the proposal, for example, in relation to incentives for sustainable NGTs and not having herbicide-tolerant NGTs, because we've heard very often, and I've heard it from many of the people in this room who were involved in discussions uh, when the proposal was made, uh, that uh, herbicide tolerance is in general not a good thing. But also, when the Commission reported on its study, and here I come to the last point, of course there are ethical issues involved in this, but there are also ethical issues in not taking action. Uh, because otherwise, research and innovation in Europe and for our SMEs, it will go elsewhere. So these are things that were taken into account. So I move now to a slide which gives you 
you were not very impressed with my potato this morning, no? My pathogen-resistant potato. But potatoes are quite important, sir. Huh? In terms of uh, nutrition, still, they remain important, no? Um, here you've got some of the examples of what's out there so far. Uh, Bruise-resistant bananas, which helps reduce food waste. I would, I mean, I think there are benefits in that. I accept that they're maybe not the greatest, no? Um, but then you see some other examples there in this pathogen-resistant potato. Um, it will reduce pesticide use. I think this is an objective that we shared. The last time I sat in this room, uh, it was with uh, uh, Eric Andrieux in relation to what had happened, the Commission's response and the Parliament's action, of course, in relation to uh, excessive use of pesticides. I mean, there is potential here to be able to reduce pesticide use um, and also reduction in costs. And then on the right-hand side, you have another example about low-gluten wheat, uh, which can, from a health point of view, uh, mean that it's easier for people who have health and gluten intolerance problems to access cheaper uh, products because they are, at the moment, still quite expensive. Um, it also can reduce medical costs, and it could even re re increase the amount uh, that farmers can make from the, the crops that they produce. So now to the proposal itself, and this is the last slide, uh, for those who've heard it before. <laughs> but uh, the, um, there are two, we've, we have suggested to have two categories. The ones on the left-hand side are the ones which are plants which are equivalent uh, to conventional breeding. Um, and here there, are, there is a verification procedure which is based on objective criteria. Uh, the criteria is based on scientific observation of what has been seen so far um, in terms of what has been produced by conventional breeding. The threshold is quite low, and as I said this morning, I think we're being very cautious uh, about the number of plants that will go into this category. I don't think all of them would fall into that, um, and the wheat example that you saw would very clearly already go into to category two. So here, and this is uh, very much uh, what we discussed uh, with stakeholders upstream, uh, the seeds should be labelled. This is particularly important for the organic farmers. Um, and we, of course, should have information clearly available in a public database and the variety catalogues about the fact that an NGT has been used. As you know, in terms of the science, there are some issues with detection of when NGT has been used, yes or not. Um, but here we would have very clear transparency through a public database. Monitoring and reporting is important, of course. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second, but just on the right-hand side, the category two, you'll see there is not a lot of difference uh, with the existing procedures uh, for GMOs. Um, we have an authorization procedure with a risk assessment. We have traceability and labeling. Um, one thing that's new is what's called a voluntary statement on the purpose of the modification. So here there would be a possibility uh, to give transparency around any sustainability traits that there may be in, in the plants. Um, and again, we're going to give some regulatory incentives, especially for SMEs, uh, for NGT plants which have desirable traits, and not forgetting uh, the all-important mandatory coexistence measures. So monitoring and reporting, and then at the bottom, um, but again, this is very much a result of the representations that were made, a prohibition um, in organic production. Uh, this morning, there were quite a few questions about that, whether it was the right thing to do. Uh, whether the category one couldn't uh, have been left as a possibility. Uh, if a plant falls into category one, why should it not be used in organic production? We had representations from some farmers in Germany, from farmers in Denmark, saying they would like to have access to this. Also, some of the younger farmers, very open uh, to the idea. But uh, we listened to the majority view, which is a ban uh, for a prohibition in the organic production. So I think that's it by way of introduction. So I hope that was interesting for those who uh, heard it this morning, uh, but I'm sorry I still, unfortunately, couldn't change the proposal be between this morning and this afternoon, even, in spite of your doubts. Uh, maybe but tomorrow. Anyway, uh, maybe tomorrow, okay. Well, that's the trick, right? Now only the Parliament and the, the Council, Council of Ministers can change. change the proposal anymore. You have done your job, and we will discuss this in a uh, minute. Uh, the first um, contributor to the debate will be Adrian Eli, who is an assistant professor at the University of Sussex and has been looking at the implications of um, governance and regulation on biotechnology in quite a few countries like France, Austria, the US, Kenya, Argentina, 
uh, China, and he takes a pathway look at the implications. What does it mean for a longer run uh, socio-economic development, especially also uh, when you have certain regulations? And the floor is yours, Adrian. Thank you, Benny. Maybe I could take the... Um, yes, you could. Slide advance, so yes. thanks. So thank you, colleagues. Um, thank you for having me, and it's an honor to be here to present this on behalf of a team at Sussex that produced this report, my colleagues, Dr. Patrick van Swanenberg, who's like me at the Science Policy Research Unit in the University of Sussex Business School, Dr. Elise Vach, and Dr. Dominic Glover, who are both at the Institute of Development Studies. We actually wrote this report and completed it uh, last month, and so before we had the details of the proposal that we've just heard about, but nevertheless, what we did really was to draw on evidence from the last... 30 years since the introduction of patented GMOs into countries where they have been wide, widely um, taken up. Just as Benny says, looking at the socio-economic and interacting social, technological and environmental changes that have um, come about uh, as a result. So this is the um, project. We don't put forward recommendations. Uh, we uh, analyze the possible implications of the, um, of the policy changes. And this work builds upon research that's been funded by the UK Economic and Social Research Council and a number of different European sources, including Dr. Van Swanenberg's continuing Marie Slodowska Curie Fellowship. So we think that the insights that we uh, draw out from this experience in the US and other countries that have taken on board uh, patented GM seeds is useful in guiding the wider decision making around uh, NGTs in the EU. And basically, the underlying finding here, which we think is uh, relevant today, is that Patented GM crops have enabled a handful, a small handful of large transnational agribusiness companies or what we call pesticide seed firms to concentrate and dominate agricultural input markets, not just in seeds, but also in herbicides, fungicides and insecticides. Um, we look at the conditions that have enabled this and we think that these uh, outputs, these, the, the pathway that has emerged has serious negative implications for environmental sustainability and we believe are in, incompatible with the ambitions of the farm to fork strategy. Um, so we also consider possible outcomes of the regulatory changes, including those just down, outlined by Ms. Berry. Um, the pathways approach, which Benny mentioned, uh, looks at the directions in which innovation may proceed on the basis of these new regulations. It looks at the diversity of different types of responses to sustainable, sustainability challenges. It looks at the distribution of costs, benefits, and risks associated with these different pathways. And it looks at the democratic um, issues that arise as a result. Um, now, at the global level, I think that most people know this. I think that Sarah Vina was talking about it in her introductory comments as much as we could hear them. We've seen, uh, at the global scale, at the, la the last 30 years, has seen a relatively diverse seed industry come under the control of a highly concentrated chemical industry. And this diagram, which is drawn from the work of Phil Howard at Michigan State University and Amos Stromberg at Lund University, illustrates this process. You've got the large red chemical companies that have either purchased or assumed partial ownership of uh, numerous different blue seed companies here and also green other, other firms. So huge levels of concentration that have emerged over the period 96 to 2022 alongside the introduction of GMOs, something that was predicted by many people at the time when these patented seeds were being introduced. So we've just got four firms, Bayer, Corteva, BASF and, Chem and Sinochem accounting for over half of the global proprietary seed market. Uh, it's even more concentrated in particular jurisdictions and in particular crops. So this is data from the US Department of Agriculture. In a report that they re uh, released this year, they analyzed IP in four different crops and 
um, suggested that 97% of US intellectual property in oilseed rape was held by these four companies with corresponding shares of 95% of maize, 84% of soybean, 74% of cotton. Um, this, these dynamics that I've laid out came alongside and were interwoven with the expansion of coupled markets for herbicides. Herbicide tolerance is something that we can discuss. But beyond herbicides, similar firms also produce fungicides, insecticides, including neonicotinoids, which in the USA are used as seed coating, coatings on most maize and soya seed. So as a result, many US, US farmers don't have the opportunity to buy bare seed that doesn't have this uh, kind of coating on it. And many farmers associations in the US, as well as, as other commentators, are concerned that GM crop commercialization has actually restricted farmers' choices around seeds and technologies. The same US DA study, which was called More and Better Choices for Farmers, noted a decline in locally and regionally adapted varieties and germplasm, and concluded with this quote, uh, taken together, the increased concentration and economies of scale for dominant companies may pose significant barriers to entry for small and medium-sized enterprises and reduce innovation. So we don't have equivalent data from the EU, but the Commission um, publications suggest that they believe levels of concentration are lower here in the EU. And these low levels of concentration, the diversity and the innovativeness of firms working in the non-GM, especially the agroecological and organic sectors, we think is something to cherish and support, and we don't think that this proposal does that. Why? Well, we looked at the different impacts and implications for these kinds of firms, smaller seed firms, and other stakeholders um, of uh, a regulatory proposal like the one we've heard from Ms. Berry. Um, these are the different uh, actors that we discuss in the report. We think that large firms which have a um, vast capability in intellectual property, uh, the dominance that we've seen before, will actually benefit from these changes because they will um, actually enhance their economies of scale across international markets. And so this puts the EU's farming sector at further risk of um, domination by these um, four large firms. Um, we think as a result that crop research and development could be steered down narrower technological paths and innovation could decline in speed and variety as competition decreases in the sector. Uh, so the diversity of the EU's seed sector and indeed its seeds is at risk. These large firms can buy smaller firms and after doing so discontinue uh, many of the varieties that are produced by the small firms, in some cases the organic or those focused on agroecological farming. So um, reduced availability, diversity and choice of seeds. Now there are European stakeholders with interests in NGTs that don't work with transgenics. We've heard some examples, at least one example of a form of NGT that tries to move away from external inputs. We believe that in most cases, these small firms or public sector breeders would be obliged to partner with or to license their intellectual property to larger firms who would be able to navigate the IP regulatory marketing and distribution challenges involved in successful commercialization. And we've seen over the past decades that large firms are quite capable of acquiring small firms that either develop technologies which would be able to enhance their large firms' existing portfolios or indeed would threaten their business models. Other stakeholders include uh, the significant proportion of EU firms and consumers that demand to choose products that exclude all forms of genetic modification. And this is not just organic agriculture. Um, however, as has been mentioned, there are challenges to the enforcement of labelling and segregation with certain NGTs for which reliable detection methods are currently not available. And these challenges effectively mean that consumers will no longer have the choice to avoid GM material in the case of the uh, Category 1 NGTs. We think this is an underappreciated problem with the proposal, requires more research, consultation and democratic debate. So segregation and um, cross-contamination of GM and non-GM seed is in particular 
important uh, for organic and agroecological sectors, which are likely to bear the brunt of the risks and disbenefits of this change. Um, the proposal suggests that organic agriculture should re retain a GM-free status, but there are many questions remaining about cross-contamination, how it will be avoided, who will be responsible for this, and who will bear the liability for adventitious presence. So we could discuss those. In sum, regulatory proposals like this could have wide and long-term implications, not only for the use of specific crop biotechnologies, but for the broader sustainable and equitable development of European agri-food systems. And we've published a study recently which looks at the uh, irreversibility or at least the long-term lock-in of these kinds of decisions. The report finally argues that these potentially irreversible implications should be weighed carefully in a broad and democratic debate which should prioritise diverse sustainable directions for European agriculture and food systems rather than placing a naive faith in a narrow pathway that locks farmers, food companies and consumers into an input-dependent technology treadmill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I assume the, the report is available? It is, as and of yesterday on the Greens EFA website. Okay. And now, as we are way behind time, I would like to introduce to you Nina Holland, and she is a researcher on agribusiness at the Corporate Europe Observatory since 2007. And as we are talking about patents, she holds a master in environmental science and made her thesis on the EU Life Patent Directive a long time ago. The floor is yours, Nina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wish I, I could say that it was more of a pleasure to be here. Um, I think we are all uh, pretty shocked by this very bad proposal from the Commission. It's a far-reaching deregulation of uh, a big category of, of GMOs. Um, so it's, it's really worse than expected and uh, what we are seeing is that the, uh, the criteria are basically arbitrary and unfounded. Um, they exclude a whole lot of GMOs from risk assessment. Uh, this will be applied to also new species that so far haven't been commercialized, like trees, uh, that will pose new risks also, for instance, to pollinators. Uh, it harms the interests of farmers. Uh, particularly GM-free and organic sector. There are no measures foreseen to allow them to stay GMO-free. They will uh, have to bear the, the brunt of the cost of that. They may even lose certification if cross-pollination occurs. Uh, consumers will lose their right to know. It undermines the precautionary principle. Uh, it doesn't allow national governments to opt out from cultivation, etc., etc. And as a cherry on the cake, uh, when we saw the leak, there was at least the exclusion from deregulation of herbicide-tolerant crops, and that has disappeared within uh, that short time. Uh, so we can now have imports of untested, unlabeled um, herbicide-tolerant uh, soy from um, from across the world uh, without any, uh, without even any risk assessment. Um, and this comes to the benefit of these few corporations, these pesticide seed corporations that still make billions of profits from pesticides and still make uh, about one third of their profit from the highest hazardous uh, pesticides. Uh, so that basically shows how serious they are about moving towards a more sustainable agriculture. And uh, I am also appalled by just seeing then again these slides that shows how much, you know, we have been documenting the, uh, in, in, in a very detailed manner the corporate lobbying on this file uh, for many years now and how flawless the, uh, uh, the Commission Biotech Unit has adopted the, the terminology and, and all the uh, um, examples and, and the phrasings and the conceptions of, uh, of uh, the industry. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, it calls it breeding. Well, this is not breeding, this is genetic engineering. Uh, it is precise, it is fast. Well, it is not that precise. There are still genetic errors, unintended effects that haven't been looked at, that are, not, are ignored in this proposal. Uh, and fast, well, actually to back cross and to produce varieties uh, that are marketable actually d does take uh, quite some time, and there are not that many on the market right now. Um, so. We have seen that DG Santis Biotech Unit has been really with industry every step of the way. Uh, 
has carried out the preparations, you know, leading up to the impact assessment and to the proposal in an ex extremely industry-friendly way. The f it started with the first targeted stakeholder consultation in 2020, uh, where around 14% of the invited were uh, were civil society organizations and 74% was industry. So Bayer and Basef were represented in multiple ways in all sorts of in industry uh, lobby platforms. Uh, it ended with uh, last summer with a completely badly designed targeted stakeholder consultation by Technopolis, uh, where they even refused to give us a breakdown of who had been invited. And it was so impossible to, to, uh, to fill in these, these answers that uh, it was even impossible for some uh, NGOs to, to even respond to the question, so they refused. So all in all, you've had a, a very biased uh, input and as well, uh, and maybe you have the slide here that I provided. I had uh, submitted two slides. So maybe it's interesting to say that based on this very undemocratic uh, process, uh, we have Friends of the Earth Europe and CEO have submitted a, a complaint to the EU Ombudsman who has started uh, um, an inquiry uh, based on that. I don't think it moves. Anyway, I think... Uh, there we go. Um, so it was biased favoring corporate interests, not evidence-based. Uh, and uh, if we go to the second slide, this was also confirmed by an expert opinion by the German Federal Agency for Nature Conservation, uh, who looked at the COM study that this was all based on from 21, and basically said uh, these are statements and opinions by stakeholders placed on equal footing with findings from empirical studies. And it's basically a, a summary of, of uh, opinions portrayed as facts. And uh, there's a, this nice graph uh, where, uh, you know, the, the move between fiction and fact, where basically say that if an organization claims that NGT could reduce uh, the use of pesticide, yesterday we've heard Vice President Timmerman saying that NGTs will reduce uh, the use of pesticides, which of course is not at all uh, a given, seeing the hands that these technologies are falling into. Um, so we've, uh, we've submitted this complaint to, to the EU Ombudsman, also based on the uh, lack of transparency uh, in this whole process, whereby, for instance, the uh, policy proposals were not even communicated to, to all stakeholders uh, at the same time. So I find this a really surreal situation where the Commission has to battle with uh, the Conservatives, who are in a, a post-truth rhetoric, uh, truly, now, uh, against all the Commission's green proposals. Uh, and meanwhile, the Commission just hands in, just gives in to the industry uh, uh, more profits, uh, while the risks and the costs for this proposal are for to bear for society and the environment. And then they even claim that these technologies will contribute to sustainability based on claims from the industry itself. Uh, so I think this is really the worst imaginable proposal and it should be rejected outright by the European Parliament and the Member States. Thank you. Clear position. <laughs> Clear statements. Heike Moldenhauer uh, today represents uh, the uh, uh, European Non-GMO Industry Association, ENGA, and she has been working for a similar organization in Germany for quite some years already, and she is working on GMOs actually since nearly as long as I do, uh, 30 years. <laughs> and uh, the floor is yours, uh, Heike, telling us about the industry's response. Uh, yes, many thanks. Uh, I uh, represent the conventional uh, non-GMO sector that are companies that exclude GM feed in uh, their products and label them as uh, non-GMO. Uh, and non-GMO is a higher standard than required by um, EU law. It's a higher transparency standard. And it's uh, driven by retailers like uh, Aldi, Lidl and Carrefour. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to comment on the legislative proposal from uh, the Commission from a food sector's perspective. Um, I was shocked, like you, when I have seen uh, the proposal, because if uh, the proposal passes into law, it would be um, yeah, the end of a GMO-free production in Europe, and it would be the end of uh, freedom of choice for uh, consumers and uh, for food business operators. Um, if I look uh, um, at this category of um, or class of NGTs uh, uh, of category one, my estimation is that that would be 95% um, of all uh, NGTs. Um, compared to a study of the Joint Research Center presented with the EC study on NGTs uh, in 2021. There in the pipeline are documented SDN1 and SDN2 um, plants, and that is, I think, about 95% of all NGTs we can expect. And for that 95% of all NGTs, there would be no um, risk assessment anymore, only notification, uh, no traceability anymore, um, no labeling, labeling only for seats, no uh, coexistence uh, rules, no detection methods, and no monitoring. So that would be, uh, that would mean that. Uh, these kind of NGTs would get lost in, in the markets. Um, the impact for um, the whole food sector would be loss of control over all value chains um, and loss of uh, consumer trust. Uh, it would be uh, the retail sector, the food sector in general, that would be confronted with anger and critical inquiries from consumers. Um, so, it, if this um, proposal uh, passes into law, that would mean that uh, we will lose the, the freedom to conduct GMO-free business. That would be completely at stake. And this proposal is made for some business. Uh, it is made for the biotech, for the seed sector. It is made for um, commodity traders. And it is made for uh, NGT exporting countries. And it is made against the interests of the food sector, in including uh, farmers, um, GMO-free breeders, food processors, and, and retailers. What we need to um, keep our value chains uh, GMO free, um, it is first of all traceability, traceability for both categories of, of NGTs for category one and category two. Then uh, we need labeling uh, for all products, not only for seeds, for um, food and feed as well. And we need a labeling for all um, business operators, not only for farmers and breeders. Um, we need uh, as well coexist coexistence measures for NGTs uh, of category one and two. And we need these coexistence measures throughout the whole value chains from, from seeds to the final product. We need it for uh, cultivation. We need it for storage, transportation, and processing. We need as well labeling uh, in case of contamination. Contamination is what we expect frequently under this uh, law. Um, we need uh, a polluter pays principle. That means that the uh, costs and the measures to uh, keep GMOs out of the value chains has to be carried by the users of uh, GMOs, not by those who don't use NGTs. So um, now the proposal uh, um, means that all burdens and all costs are with those who don't want to use NGTs. That is a question of justice, and that is highly 
unjust. So, um, ma to conclude, um, concealing NGTs um, is, is a wrong track, and it would undermine the trust in political institutions and in, in the food industry as well. And if, as the Commission says, and um, the industry says, NGTs are so convincing and wonderful, then there is no reason to exclude them from labeling. I think it is important to have the, the freedom of choice for all business operators, for all consumers, and NGTs have uh, to accept uh, um, the judgment of business operators and, and consumers. So therefore, labeling, labeling, and labeling. Many thanks. Thank you, Heike. And uh, we move over to Alessandra Turco, who has come all the way from Italy, from her farm, to address us here. She is a member of the coordination committee of La Via Campesina, the small uh, farmers' organization in Europe. And she is specialized in uh, the defense of farmers' rights to seeds. And she will be speaking French. And for those who need translation, number two is English and number one is German. You can choose it uh, with these buttons next to the ear uh, down here. Alessandra. Oui, merci pour, uh... Thank you very much for your presentations. I'm quite uh, emotional about this. I've come from Italy. I harvested uh, wheat at the weekend. The previous week it was potatoes. So when we talk about these issues, these are issues that affect my work and my ability to make a living. I, for 30 years, I have been working in farmers' units for small scale farmers and agricultural workers. And in our approach, it's based on uh, small scale farming, on peasant farming. There's been a great deal of investment on our own work in the soil. And this is linked to the way that we produce. It's a holistic approach. which is uh, very closely linked to our ability to live and feed the population that live alongside us. So we always try to maximize production inputs within the farm. And one of the most important aspects is um, dynamic management of biodiversity. This is an opportunity for us to have a farming which adapts and which allows us to draw up different strategies for market and production difficulties, the climate crisis, and, uh, and managing the farm. So I farm wheat, as I was saying. I am rather surprised, therefore, at the process at global and European level, because we, are in the Green Revolution, they're trying to increase the level of gluten in, gluten in wheat. And now with the Green Deal, they're trying to uh, reduce gluten in wheat. And this restricts our ability to make bread. P bread in Europe is... Uh, one of the staples of our diets. Genetic manipulation of seeds is something which is part of my life. And we should think about ha changing our habits and our ways, way of living on this planet. This regulation has an 
impact on two levels. First of all, um, economically, and see, especially when it comes to organic farming and small scale farmers. But there's also a direct loss of choice for farmers. And we can only do this if we keep regulation in place and only if we develop tools, detection tools of, for GMOs. There is the idea of the precautionary principle and managing biodiversity, but if we lose this ability to distinguish NGTs from other crops and other organisms, then we will lose our ability to manage biodiversity and our choice and the notion of traceability, something that's been mentioned several times here today. So for us, this is at the heart of our ability to survive uh, as producers. And this is also linked to our right. I'm trying to uh, be brief because many things have already, have already said many things. But I think that we should also highlight the link with uh, farmers' rights to seed. Article 9 of uh, plant resources for uh, agriculture and food. This guarantees access to seeds for farmers to uh, exchange, to, to cultivation, etc. And, and now we are affected by an extension of uh, scope. If we have biodiversity which is based on uh, coexistence and the fact that member states, national states cannot uh, intervene on spreading seeds in their own countries, then we will be in a situation where it's impossible for states or us to stop the spreading of those organisms. And so in, and in those cases, there'll be a lot of contamination, cross-contamination, because as a farmer, I won't be able to limit the spread of, uh, of, of, of these organisms because and pollen because these because there is uh, nothing that would be able to prevent that it's uh, difficult or impossible to manage directly we have to uh, coexist and the idea of our biodiversity being contaminated and this being patented then this is this leads to biopiracy and a loss of ability for us to manage our own seeds. So we need to have our own food sovereignty here in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. And uh, finally, we have uh, Dr. Christoph Tin, who needs access to the table. And uh, he is uh, the director of No Patents on Seeds as well as the director of Test Biotech, both based in uh, Munich and also an old veteran of uh, GMO disputes. Um, and he will be looking at the science behind the new proposal, I think. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, thanks for all the interesting presentations so far. I have a very easy uh, task now. I only have to talk about uh, science things, which normally are easy to understand. So you, I'm sure you will can follow easily. Um, I, we focus, for, for, for keeping it simple, uh, on category one. 
uh, not the whole proposal, and on category one is because it's very important, because it defines plants which are similar to conventional breeding and therefore uh, are supposed to be exempted from risk assessment and everything else we heard today. So um, I have start with some general comments. Uh, so yes, we think um, category one uh, is a kind of deregulation because um, the plants exempted or defined thereby will be exempted from mandatory risk assessment. And of course, this is some kind of deregulation, should not be named something else. Um, the decision making within um, these uh, category one plants uh, to, to, to be exempted from um, the risk assessment and from the mandatory approval process can be taken on the member st uh, states level. This seems to be problematic because they will take this decision on the level before experimental releases take place, and after that there seems to be no reassessment after the outcome of the, of the uh, experimental releases. Uh, the decision will stay valid, as far as I understand the category, which would be very strange. So as soon as there is an impact on the EU level state, um, um, the notification is already done. Uh, on the impact, it's also very strange to see that not only agricultural plants, but also undomesticated plants like trees, like mosses, like weeds, like grasses, um, uh, uh, and algae, all goes in there where we do not have any uh, experience in releasing these plants into these complex ecosystems. And finally, there are some regulatory uncertainties because it seems like the criteria in Annex 1, which are supposed to define um, this category, can be changed any time by the European Commission again. So it looks like um, we have now 20. Um, uh, a number of 20 or four for genetic um, changes in the plant. It might be in future, it might be 40 or 50, just by decisions taken by the European Commission, which is delegated to take these um, changes. So this was very general. It's, so this seems to be a very, let's say, um, complicated um, proposal in this regard, very generally, very complicated from a regulatory point of view. Now let's go a little bit more to science. Um, we see that um, the proposed uh, categories are neglecting basic science, what goes on in the plant cells, to maintain gene functions normally in the plant cells. There are uh, specific functions like uh, uh, many gene copies, repair mechanisms, um, uh, genetic linkage, and all these um, are part of the genome organization meant to maintain gene functions. And so uh, the main technical advantage of NGTs, so CRISPR-Cas, for example, is to overcome these, um, these uh, mechanisms in the cell and to create plants which go beyond these um, uh, genome organizations, which is restricting conventional plant breeding, to come to traits and, and, and events which so far were not known. And so on the advantage side, it's very clear, this is why breeders or, or, or companies want to have the technology. But on the risk assessment side, this is completely set aside. It's just proposed that these, all these um, mutations occurring in the plant cells can be equalized, which is simply not true. For our uh, perspective, this ignorance of the basic biological mechanisms in the cell is caused by the European Commission. It's because the European Commission never asked the decisive question to EFSA. EFSA had never a chance, was never mandated to look into these details. Just shortly, we saw a fact sheet saying EFSA, yes, we did it. But <laughs> when you look to the EFSA opinions and reports, in fact, it was not done. So um, uh, in result, the criteria proposed in the, in the Annex 1 are arbitrary such as the number of overall genetic changes in a genome, which is just, it's, I, when I saw this, I wanted to cry and run away, because from a scientific point of view, this is so ridiculous to come up with an overall threshold of number of, of genetic changes overall in genome. I don't know where this comes from. And, but also the other uh, criteria, like um, the number of substitutions, nucleotides in the genome, and, and the way how the breeder's gene pool is, is, is defined or used, this all is not really based on science. What on the other side is missing are the decisive at, um, biological issues like the site where the genetic change takes place, the resulting genetic combination, the genotype, 
and the resultant phenotype, which can be, of course, largely different um, between a conventional breeding and, 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 and NGT plants, even if only a slow number of nucleotides is changed. And then we tried to do apply the criteria on two examples, which are very well known. One is the GABA tomato, which is an increased um, concentration of, uh, of, of, of um, gamma butyric acids, which is meant to be blood pressure relaxing. And we know from um, the publication, which was published on this tomato, that conventional breeding was not able to achieve these uh, plants. Then we look to camelina, which is with a change in oil content for agrifuels, which has a completely uh, strong change in the composition of the acid, of the oleic acids. And we also see from the publication that it was not possible to achieve these plants by um, conventional breeding. Then we look to the criteria, then we see that it looks like these plants could be within the criteria as proposed by the Commission. So basically, we would have plants which are definitely different in their biology, substantially different in their biology, but nevertheless would be equalized uh, uh, legally from a legal point of view by the criteria. This is something which really has to be um, looked at in detail and um, cannot be accepted. So in the conclusion, uh, we still think that without risk assessment, NGT plants are more or less a black box. Um, there are specific risks which go along with the processes, can be spread and accumulated in the environment, in, in, in the breeding populations, and also in the food chain. And therefore, the category one, as proposed, really has to be deleted from the new regulation and cannot be maintained from our point of view. And of course, this is just a starting point. We, we do not say that we are happy with category two, but category one is really the one which is uh, so decisive uh, from point of deregulation, and therefore we started with looking into the details of this category one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. And now, last not least, to the host of uh, this session today, Martin Häusling. I don't think I have to introduce him to too many people uh, here. And even not to Pierre Bury, <laughs> but to listen to him already twice today. And I think um, it's your job to wrap up and give us enough time, especially to give Pierre Bury enough time to respond to what we call a volle Breitseite in uh, German. <laughs> Go ahead. So I make my speech in German, if you need translation. Yeah, we have us had two times. We've already met at twice today in Envy and Agri. We've already exchanged points of view and in line with others. I hoped, I had high hopes for this draft. I didn't want it to be like this in this iteration, but it is, so I have to deal with it, categorize it politically. I think that the Commission is not taking on board European principles. So consumer protection to, should be to the fore. We should only put something on the market if it's been checked. You know, you can check, you can say that you're checking GM technologies, but it's as useful as checking the technology behind a Hoover. So the issue of labeling is completely political as well. So we have the ruling of the European Court of Justice and there have been attempts to circumvent and now they're saying, well, this new GMO is apparently not a GMO. These NGTs are apparently not a GMO. So what the Commission is doing is giving in to the Conservatives. Okay, so basically you're saying if you, Conservatives, accept a pesticide reduction, then you'll get the NBTs. So if you don't vote this way, then you won't get NBTs. So those who wanted NBTs are getting them now. That's the political deal. We heard from Timmermans today, yesterday. 
Timmerman says that MBTs are the answer and will allow us to use fewer pesticides. Well, look at the discussion. I, I, I did say this earlier and I said, where's the proof? Does genetic modification, you know, lead to less pesticides? In Brazil and the US, it hasn't. And for 25 years, we've been talking about GMOs and the fields and less pesticides and resistant plant types. But 25 years ago, we had anti-rot uh, tomatoes. Now we have anti-rot bananas. So I think there was a point this morning that you didn't respond to, which was the issue of patents. This morning we heard, OK, there might be patents, but we'll check it. We'll have to see what happens on the market. You know, there might be patents, there might not. But look at Mr. Burningen from via Monsanto. And he has said on Twitter that he will apply for patents. Thank you. We, we do that. That's our business model. You know, a lot of the revenue in the U.S. comes from s licensing. So that's something that makes me so angry. I think the commission is not being clear about the patent issue, being a bit dishonest about the patents, and it will erode our European system bit by bit in the long term. Then there's another argument that comes up time and time and time again. You're treating consumers as if they were stupid and as if they wouldn't understand. Uh, you know, uh, we'll label it this way and they'll, they'll eat it. That seems to be the logic. Over the years, you've been trying to make GMOs palatable to consumers. So now you're just giving them GMOs, but with a different name. It is misleading to consumers. Now, what about the issue of organic farming? Maybe some young organic farmers do want to use MBTs. That's what you say. I don't think so. I worked on organics and the organic regulation for four years. I know the sector like the back of my hand. I know no farmer in the organic sector that wants CBTs. They don't want them. And that is still the case. And look at the conventional non-GMO sector. The conventional non-GMO sector will also suffer because of the controls, the checks, the monitors. Now, you say that this is just uh, an issue of seed and buying in seed, but what if my neighbor uses this seed? Then there's cross-contamination. And then what do you say to the organic farmer? Oh, bad luck. And then we're supposed to have this goal that we're pursuing of having 25% organic farming. Doesn't add up. Now we had this discussion in Envy this morning. It was quite balanced. But in Agri, uh, one of the Libe members said that they thought it was like Christmas. They said Christmas has come early with this regulation. Well, good for him. But this will be a hard political discussion. You know, we're all on the same side here, but we need to have a new discussion on GMO. And what we are hearing here is a pipe dream. It's a chimera. You say that these plants are going to be resistant to pests uh, via glyphosate. But I don't think we will have drought-resistant plants. Zaravina said it this morning. OK, you might have some plants that are able to deal with drought, but then what about two weeks later when, it, when there's torrential rain? We can't solve all problems through technical means. We also have to do it through agri and agricultural systems. But I think what we have here takes farming in the wrong direction. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Martin.
Um, Thank you very much. Ms. Berry, you have taken lots of note. I think we could all say that now you have time to respond to what has been said. I would be particularly interested to hear how you want to um, prevent a division in what we understand by sustainability. Many speakers here have spoken about a complete attack on the concept of sustainability uh, and ecology and farming in general. It's not just about individual definitions, but you have the floor first. Thank you. Okay, yes, thank you. I've been listening very carefully. That's why I've been notes, no? Okay, so first of all, I want to come to this question about what the state of the market is and uh, uh, what Professor Eli pr presented and so on. So uh, I think uh, what the evidence that we have from the CPVO, the Variety Office at the moment, is that actually 90% of the registration of variety rights were submitted by SMEs in Europe. So this is how healthy our seed market is and we want to keep it that way. So in the plant reproductive materials, it's not a proposal that we're discussing in, in detail um, now, uh, but in that proposal, we have uh, very much taken into account the need to have lighter rules for conservation, lighter rules for seed banks, um, rules which will help promote our genetic diversity. So the Commission is very much attached to this, and I think we need to see uh, these proposals together. It's not like the US here in terms of the market, and it's not like the US here in terms of the situation in relation to patents either. Because already we have um, Article 11 of the Biotech Directive, which says that farmers can save seeds of patented plants. They can save them, they can reuse them. This is what's known as the farmer's privilege. There is also a possibility for farmers to use patented genetic material. We have uh, in force for some months now this agreement on the Unitary Patent Court, and there we have something called the Limited Breeders Exception, uh, which gives them the right to use patented genetic material to develop new varieties. So already we have a very different patent landscape to that in the US. Now, we come to the point where you said this morning I was avoiding the issue. On, on, on the other question, which is what happens with these technologies when they may be patentable under the biotech directive. Um, I did not need to be flippant. I was very clear that the Commission is taking this very seriously. Um, and I neither did I say we'll kick the can down the road. I said we need to look at it now. Um, in its communication, the Commission said we will analyse this between now and 2026. You know very well and I hope we'll have the pleasure in the next legislative mandate of working together too, um, how long it takes for, for proposals to be negotiated. I'm not saying how long this one should last, no, but I'm just saying you know very well how it goes. Um, and also there's a two-year period uh, before it will come into force. So we have now a little bit of time in which we can look at the situation and see if anything needs to be done. The Commissioner said, of course, we need to promote innovation, but we also need to protect seeds and we need to protect access of both breeders and farmers to seeds. So please come with evidence now because the Commission will be looking at it over the next few years. If you think there are going to be problems then come with evidence. Um, now pieces of legislation can be changed of course. Um, the biotech directive dates from 1998 and I think was very difficult to negotiate. Huh? Uh, but we can also do other things in the meantime, like we can have interpretative guidance. Now, I was quite surprised by what people were saying in the committee this morning about what the EPO would come and said. Maybe it's not that unsurprising that CRISPR-Cas might be covered by a patent, no? because they did win a Nobel Prize for it at the end of the day. No? So there must have been a certain amount of research and, and know-how that went into it. But I'm not saying that that is the good example either. I think we really need to look at this. We need to weigh the evidence and we need to see if there will be action. And that's what the Commission said. Uh, we will take action if necessary. So please come with the evidence and let's have uh, the discussion on that. 
Now, the second thing about the criteria for uh, the Category 1 NGTs, it's based on scientific literature, and it's based on a work that's been done by the Joint Research Centre. I said this morning, I say again, I think it's a relatively cautious threshold. I don't think that it's going to be... Um, that everything is going to fall into that category. I think it's, it's quite low, but no doubt this will be an issue that we will um, have more discussion on. Um, Nina, you said uh, the proposal got worse because herbicide tolerance was taken out. I think it got better, actually, because the fact that that leaked, there was then a discussion around herbicide tolerance more generally, and the issue has been put into the PRM proposal on the seeds in general. Because if there's a problem with herbicide tolerance, it's not just because there are NGO plants which are herbicide tolerant, it's because there's herbicide tolerance in general. So we need to deal with it as a bigger issue. Um, and you will see that there are other parts of the proposal which make very clear that anything that's herbicide tolerant wouldn't be able to access any of the incentives and so on. So I, on this, we have really listened uh, to, to what was said. Of course, we can still discuss how far it goes, but um, the Commission has not been deaf, has not been tone deaf on this. Um, and we have been listening to all the stakeholders, and we will respond to the complaint that has been made. Uh, but when I look around the room and I see everybody who's here, plenty of, we, we have been discussing with all of you as well upstream uh, in terms of what has gone into the proposal. The scientific evidence comes from EFSA. It does not come from industry. This is, EFSA has been working on this for the best part of seven or eight years. I, I'm going blue in the face with looking at EFSA's independence policy. I'm sure there are still things that can be improved, but there is really, it's, it's trusted science in, in EFSA. I don't know what else we can do if we can't use that advice uh, from, from EFSA. Um, and to close, if I may, freedom of choice. Heike, you said it's very important. Yes, and that's why we put in the ban on the NGTs in organic, because we clearly understood uh, from the organic farmers that they wanted to be able to maintain that as their choice. Maybe there are parts of the organic sector that you, that you don't reach, I don't know, but we did hear other voices, I have to say, but we respected the view of the majority. But we also have to respect those who are doing a different kind of farming, be it agroecology, be it whatever, uh, the younger farmers, all the other representations we got about wanting to be able to use uh, these tools. And last, um, this idea that there will be a loss of control, that we're trying to conceal information, when there's going to be a public register where the information will have to be lodged, there will be labelling of seeds. Nobody is trying to hide information. It will be there, clearly. And I think you say... Let's have a democratic discussion, so let's have the democratic discussion. Let's try and explain as well um, so that consumers will be able to make, make their choice. So, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Curie. We have, unfortunately, just four minutes uh, left because we started a little late and uh, bumpy. So I would uh, take these two questions, it's simply, or no, I'll take this question and the lady in the back. And um, this is all we can do, unfortunately, uh, in, the, in the remaining time, I'm sorry for that. We might have in the second uh, half uh, chances to discuss, especially the patent aspects, uh, into more depth again. Thank you. Um, Madam Barry, uh, I, I will not go into all the topics that have been mentioned already. I, I underline everything that has been said. Uh, but one political question, and please don't just say, well, ask this to my commissioner. Uh, with this proposal, you know, like every child understands that uh, a technical genetical modification is not a nature-based solution. So why do you try to sell it as that? Uh, uh, it, it is clear that this is a, a proposal that discredits the Green Deal of the Commission, that discredits the attempt uh, of pushing Green Deal policy through. This is a proposal that 
uh, brings the, the biggest allies of the Commission, that raises them against them politically, that raises resistance. And you see already that it's pretty hard to get through the Green Deal proposals, legal proposals through the Parliament. So what's the, what, did you actually consider that you might lose support for the Green Deal as such with this proposal that you're, that you're upcoming with here? And last but not least, there's big parts of European population that are absolutely not happy with them being, uh, let's say, uh, uh, well, un unable to, to see what they eat and to see what they buy. And there's whole states, like my very own home state, Austria, that considers itself GMO-free, which is impossible if that proposal gets into legislation. And that will fuel and is already fueling massively anti-EU and anti-Commission sentiments, which we, many of us, try to actually lower in the countries. We try to to defend this Green Deal and defend a, a common European approach to forestry, to new agriculture methods, and so on and so forth. And with this proposal, you're really giving a big blow to that support and a big blow also potentially uh, to the support of the European Union as a project as such. Did you consider that? I'll make my question short. <laughs> I have one question. How? Uh, I'm a conventional and organic seed producer in the Netherlands. I have one question. How do I keep my seed patent and GMO free? That is a question I would like to have been answered. Okay, thank you. Um, Yes, I know how hard it is to get through the Green Deal proposals. You know, I've been working for the last year on the sustainable use of pesticides huh? um, with the colleagues battling, trying to explain, going out in the fields, trying to work out, trying to help, trying to cajole, trying to whatever. So I'm out there every day trying to do that, huh? like you, okay? So we want to do that. Huh? Um, but, and, and of course, I, we are not trying to sell something um, as what it isn't. No, we're not saying, I'm not saying this is nature. There is clearly biotechnology at work here. Huh? But what we're saying is we need to distinguish between a GMO, which has a foreign DNA that's introduced. That's transgenesis, it's not GMO. Transgenesis. Okay, let's go, all right, let's talk about it very, okay, transgenesis as opposed to the mutagenesis and the cisgenesis. Huh? That, that in this room makes sense, but it doesn't make sense to people necessarily in the street. But what we have to find is a way of trying to explain the differences to them. No, because you can't put it all in the same basket, I don't think, from a biotech point of view. Right? So, but sorry, I mean, there is a question which is above my pay grade, no, I'm afraid. I'm only a, a mere deputy director general, not. I mean, I, the way that the vice president put it is, uh, but you were not so happy with that, no, but all the elements are out there on the table now. You need to decide. Um, you know, where the priorities lie and, and what will go forward. Huh? I don't think the Commission can do more than that uh, because there are parts of the Parliament which have been asking very, very strongly. But anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm going into ground that I shouldn't because uh, it, it's, as I say, it's above my, my pay grade. But of course, I'm sorry, I, I've worked for 30 years for the EU. I care nothing more about the credibility of this um, organisation that we work for than that people believe in it. Huh? Um, and of course, even more so when the country that I originally came from has now left the EU and so on. It's really, um, it's a passion. Um, so I'm with you on that. Huh? Uh, we absolutely have to do that. Huh? Um, but of course, you know, politicians have to make the decisions about what they think, the things that go forward and the things that don't go forward. Huh? Thank you very much. We come to an end. Ah. Uh, oh, you yes, did not course. answer sorry. her question. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, I got too carried away there, sorry, yeah. with, the, uh, with Mr. Weiss's question, sorry. Yes, of course. Um, well, I think on how can it stay the GMO free part, um, obviously it's very clear with the category two ones that there will be, there are some changes in the procedure, but it's substantially the current regime that applies in terms of uh, the labelling, the traceability, and the mandatory coexistence, and the member states have to make sure that there are measures that are taken. Of course, different member states do that in different ways. Um, but on the category one, there, our argument is that because they are similar uh, to conventional products, um, then there should be the register 
there should be the labelling. And of course, in relation to the coexistence, uh, then farmers can agree measures as far as coexistence is concerned. I mean, if you're a farmer, you know very well whether your neighbour, you will know very well whether your neighbour is growing NGD plants, yes or no. Uh, some crops have has an isolation uh, distance from uh, uh, five kilometres. I do not know. Five kilometres, it's way too far. Pollen can drift that far. Okay. I think there is a lot to discuss uh, at many different levels uh, left. I remember how I was uh, sitting not in this building, it didn't exist yet, but in a building over there 35 years ago trying to figure out the definition of what is a GMO. And it was a very lengthy discussion, it was a very open discussion. We included all the science and uh, the, the your predecessor, so to speak, Joanna Tachminses, um, uh, who then took responsibility for proposing this um, definition, and the definition had not been changed, actually, by the Parliament and the, uh, and the Council of Ministers, I believe did a great job. For me, this proposal of yesterday is the end of a precautionary approach that we tried to enshrine 35 years ago, I have to say, personally. And I fall out of my uh, role as a, as a moder um, moderator, uh, obviously. And I think we should take great care not to end up with having alternative truths. You remember uh, when uh, the spokesperson of Mr. Trump said, yes, I see these pictures, but you know there are alternative truths. And we are at a point very close to this when it comes to defining what is natural and what is not natural. And this whole cisgenetics, intragenetics, breeders, uh, uh, pool uh, reasoning, which has been developed uh, more than 20 years ago to appease Christian parties in, in the Netherlands and their ethic, right, is simply not based on the state of scientific knowledge we have today, and this is way more than we had 35 years ago. There we still believe DNA makes RNA makes protein. It's that simple, right? We know much, much more and instead we depart to storytelling, to scientific storytelling about what constitutes genetic engineering and what not. And I think we should come back to some kind of joint understanding of what we mean. If we don't do this, we will end up in terrible type of fights. And I really see this as a great chance now that we have another half year or so in the parliament, in the, in the Council of Ministers, the Commission has done her job, um, to find a solution on at least having a common understanding of what we mean when we talk about sustainability. And uh, I see it jeopardized today, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I might uh, use this microphone again just to say that we will now make a short break um, and meet back here at 4.45 for the um, discussion on patterns where we have a lot of open questions, I think.
Now. Yeah, okay. I don't know why it was not okay no worries okay but now we have uh, enough mics anyways over oh, here okay, so, so you just it. no no but
so if I could ask you to take your seats so that we can continue with the panel discussion. May I ask the panelists to get to the stage? Thank you. Yeah, it's not very loud. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. Back to the second uh, panel, where we will now focus on patterns on conventional breeding, but as well on new GMO. As we heard in the first round, there are a lot of open questions, uh, but we are happy today to have a lot of experts who did a lot of research in this field and will be able to answer um, one uh, many of the open questions. Um, so, at the first part of this uh, panel, we will have uh, two research reports that will be presented. And then afterwards, we have, as you see, a, a, a lot of panelists uh, that will then have uh, the opportunity to give us their input as well. And if we um, um, manage to keep to the schedule, more or less, we might have some time for answers. 
But anyways, after the presentations, um, there will be a chance to ask as well questions. Um, so for the first presentation, I will hand over to Dagmar Urban from Achenoa, a seed savers organization that is based in Brussels and uh, Vienna. They are working on patents on seeds for a long time. Um, and they are as well uh, members of the European coalition No Patents on Seeds. Thank you, Johanna, and thank you, everyone um, who came here today, and uh, also to the MEPs who host this very important discussion. Um, I have some slides prepared, um, and uh, uh, yeah, um, to start with, um, the overall message that we really feel um, out there um, when um, we, as uh, Arenoa, talk to breeders in our participatory breeding projects and care about the conservation in our private collection, um, which um, has more than 6,500 different varieties, um, is really that patents on seeds threaten our food system as a whole. Um, yeah, the report I'm presenting now is from No Patents on Seeds. Um, and uh, what you're going to hear in the next 15 minutes from me is, first of all, the questions, um, patents on seeds. Um, and then I have some examples from the very many examples um, on recent patent applications in Europe, recently granted patents, and the impacts. Um, and then when we hear, um, yeah, about all the problems, I also have um, some policy recommendations on how we can free the seeds again from the patents. Um, to start with um, patents on seeds, every time I talk to someone um, and tell them, oh, I'm working on um, patents on conventional seeds, they're like, oh, no, that doesn't even exist. It's maybe only on GMOs. It's not a thing. Are you sure? Um, and unfortunately, this is true. Um, we have patents on conventional seeds that should not exist, but they do. Um, we have uh, the European Patent Convention, so it's not an EU institutional thing, but um, the European Patent Organization um, has uh, 38 member states, um, it's, it's larger than the EU, and there's an article in there, um, in the convention, that says plant and animal varieties, um, um, and also essentially biological processes, are excluded from patentability. Um, then um, we also have um, the EU Biotech um, Directive, oh, the slides are unhappy, um, from uh, um, 98. Um, that was made to um, get legal protection for a biotechnological intervention, and this is a directive that allows patents on genetic engineering. Um, but the European Patent Office has been granting patents on conventional seeds over many years now. Um, so we have a problem that shouldn't exist, and I think um, we should fix it. And additionally, now with new GMOs, um, of course, the problem gets um, even bigger, as we will hear in the second report. Um, oh, okay, the slides are <laughs> continuously I'm not happy. Um, what I wanted to show you on the next slide um, is uh, something we heard already from uh, Sarah Wiener at the beginning, and I think we all know, but it's good to um, see it once in a while again. The global seed market is already very centralized. We have the big um, four um, companies that have over 50% of the market share. Um, and then we see um, what happens with patents in Europe. So these are the granted patents on plants um, in Europe overall, including GMOs. Um, it's again kind of the same big guys that have the global seed market share. So we see Corteva, Bayer, BSF, Syngenta as the top ones. Um, if you look who gets patents on conventional plants in Europe, again, it's uh, not very creative. We see Bayer, BSF, Corteva as the first three ones. Um, so um, there's a correlation here. Um, and if you see what kind of patents are granted on conventional plants, um, we really see a, a lot of variety and really important crops for our food production here too. Um, so maize had the most um, granted conventional patents. Um, then we have the brassica group um, and tomatoes, wheat, um, and so on. Um, so um, what are, what are the, the whole problems around this. First of all, um, the patent system was established to protect technical inventions with the idea to foster innovation. Um, from the very beginning, I think um, if we tell someone on the street, um, plants are not technical inventions. Um, they create um, monopolies and the patent holder can exclude um, breeders from accessing the material. 
um, or um, also like negotiate license fees. And uh, uh, since um, in the debate before it was claimed that this problem is now solved with the unitary, unitary patent, unfortunately it's not because the old system first of all exists in parallel and at the same time it's not a very strong breeder's exemption as we have in uh, different um, in the plant variety law where the breeder can really um, use material and uh, breed and then um, commercialize also. The new breeder's exemption is rather a research exemption where you can test and, and research um, um, even with patented material, but you need to negotiate if you want to commercialize. So again, for small and medium-sized breeders, um, this does not solve the problem. And breeding needs access to biological diversity. If you look to wheat, for example, it's not that you change one gene and then the whole thing is your invention. There have been thousands of years of crossing and selections and different kind of breeding methods. And, and those, those just don't vanish um, if you just have yeah, any kind of one new step involved. Um, so uh, I want to go to um, two recent patent applications on uh, conventional breeding in Europe so that you see what kind of uh, problems are um, happening right now. Um, oh, that's a bit small, but you see a soya bean and a tomato. Um, and uh, the No Patents on Seeds report um, did a lot of research um, on what kind of patents um, yeah, um, were applied for in Europe um, over the last year. And there were 100 patent applications on conventional breeding just last year. Um, from the recent examples, we have, for example, a soybean um, that um, has resistance to Asian soybean rust. And um, this is really not what you would um, expect of, a, of an invention if you don't know um, patent law. Um, there were gene variants that were detected in the wild relatives of the soybeans and then there was crossing and selections and um, yeah, markers were identified but it's all conventional and then you have um, soybeans that um, have some genes that correlate with increased resistance and then the patent applications want to patent all plants that have um, these gene variants. And it's very long, so if you look at the patent applications, there's uh, 200 pages of um, all those very tiny um, change um, in the genes. Um, and there are 45,000 that are claimed to be patented, including all plants um, that have this variation. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, yeah, very, very far reaching. Um, we also have a similar situation um, with uh, resistance to um, the tomato brown glucose fruit virus, which is a really threatening um, um, tomato production, where um, there were resistances found in wild relatives um, of tomatoes, and then used with crossing and selections, um, and the gene variants that, that have like uh, correlation with resistance were claimed as the inventions. For those patents, very often, Additionally um, to finding these um, gene variants, there are like top-up um, steps. So sometimes there is um, CRISPR-Cas added after or random um, mutations also added. Um, but essentially um, the results um, are um, from conventional breeding. Um, and then you have several um, companies doing that at the same time. So this is all the, um, yeah, the, the so-called Jordan virus um, patent applications. It's different companies in a patent run on the same chromosome, sometimes um, even overlapping. And um, it's extremely complex. No um, small or medium-sized breeder can even find out if they're affected or not. Um, and it's uh, also really not the um, idea of the patent law. Um, so those were two examples of um, patent applications. Um, and now I have uh, one more example from granted patents. Um, I have a picture of a European patent um, um, application, or this is now, yeah. Um, this is a maze with improved digestibility from um, KWS, um, and it was granted um, exactly a year ago. Um, and uh, the basic idea um, was um, also in these patents that there were um, gene variants found that have a certain resistance. Um, and then there is a patent on um, all the genes um, that, that uh, yeah, comprise um, this trait. And we also have um, cold tolerance um, as one of the patented um, characteristics. 
Um, so these are patents that are being granted, not just applications. Um, and we really see that they are very complex, very long, and um, KWS even has a section on their website that's, that says native trade catalog. Um, so um, it's very clear that we are talking about um, native traits um, that are here. And again, on these patents, there are um, top-up technical methods, sometimes added, so you add random mutagenesis, you add CRISPR-Cas to make the whole thing um, sound a bit more technical, but the essential um, trait that are patents come um, from normal conventional breeding. Um, oh, this is destroyed. Okay. Um, so not having luck with the presentation today. Um, but the idea is um, when I talk to um, people about patents, I think, oh, it's not that many patents. Um, so we have around the uh, um, 200 granted patents on conventional plants in Europe by now, but it's not just one patent, one problem. One patent is on a trait, on a characteristic, and um, can affect a lot of varieties. So in the No Patents and Seeds report, um, it was checked in the Pinto database, it is the voluntary database um, of, of the industry, and the 100 patents there affect um, over 1,200 varieties, which are already on the market. Um, and um, one single patent um, in this research affected up to um, 175 varieties that are already on the market. Um, so very few patents um, can have really big impact in the food chain, which also creates a lot of urgency when looking into the issue and when solving the issue, because if every day we have uh, new patent applications um, affecting hundreds of varieties, um, the problem gets bigger very, very fast and faster as some people might um, be ready to analyze the problem. Um, yeah. Um, and we can already see um, also, um, these are pictures from um, Achenoa um, and our seed archive, that um, they really impact the whole food chain. Like we get breeders who call us and say, oh, are we affected by this? I don't understand. And no small or medium sized breeders even um, has a legal department to understand these patent applications. And I've been working for four years on the issue and I also sometimes really don't understand the patent applications without working for days on them. And they should not have to. Um, there was a clear intention of the EU biotech directive to have conventional um, breeders out, and they are not, um, and this is a problem we need to solve, and we need to really work on not ma making the problem um, even bigger. Um, an issue close to me um, also as an Austrian is that we had a lot of problems in the Austrian beer sector um, because there are already um, quite a lot of patents on barley and beer, and they really reach through until the beer you have um, in your glass, on your table. So the patents do not only affect the seeds, but very often they also claim the harvest, um, the seeds, and also food production and the final food product. Yeah, so um, the legal situation, so that we also know how we can um, probably um, fix at least part of the problem. Um, so we have the EU patent directive on the technical um, in, uh, in inventions that are patentable, and um, they were kind of made to make clear that GMOs can be patented. Um, this um, was under discussion, so um, this was the political compromise, um, and um, it's uh, kind of an exception of an article in the European Patent Convention. Um, and since it was clear that only the biotechnological invention should be patented, it's also very clear that random mutagenesis, all the naturally occurring gene um, variations as we had with the maize patents of WKS, um, or crossing and selections should not be patentable. Um, and if there is a patent granted, a problem we have right now that um, very often it affects also other like non-GMO plants with the same traits. And there also we need clarity on the scope that a patent um, on a GMO is on this GMO and doesn't affect um, other conventional varieties. Um, yeah, and uh, since we are now here on EU level, um, also um, to have a quick look on what happened um, in the last years. So um, there have been discussions and there has been the awareness that there are problems, but right now we still yeah, have problems. 
um, the, the European Patent Office has been granting um, those patents for quite a while, and there were several clear statements of um, EU institutions in the past. Um, so there were European Parliament resolutions in um, 2012 and 15, and the Commission's notice um, in 2016, and there was a small step forward making um, yeah, less patents um, on conventional seats um, available if they only um, have crossing and selection in it, um, but still patents on um, random mutations and on natural gene variants and markers um, are being granted. Um, so, um, what can we do now? Um, on the specific issue on the um, patents on seeds and on GMOs, Christoph will um, follow up. Um, so I'm now um, really focusing on the conventional part. Um, I actually have good news. I think it's um, rather easy um, to um, find um, a fix for this part of the problem because the laws are already there. It's basically a question of the correct interpretation. The EU directive had a clear goal and um, so it's about getting the interpretation that was intended also to the EPO and really make clear that patents on any processes um, that includes crossing and selection, naturally occurring um, or also randomly generated genes um, are just not patentable and that the scope of patent is restricted to GMOs. It does not say that I'm in favor of patents on GMOs, but with um, the current laws we have um, with uh, only an interpretation, um, we could fix this problem on the conventional part. Um, for the new GM part, um, yeah, of course there are different interpretations. You should maybe not um, go into deregulation of something um, before you know the, the impacts of GMOs. Um, yeah, and um, this is very weird. Um, I have a, like um, my life has been consisting of technical problems today, um, <laughs> and from a broken laptop to printers. Um, but um, yeah, it's also almost the last slide. Um, so we really think that the European patent organizations should um, not patent things um, that should not be patentable according um, to the. Um, yeah, to, to their convention and also the EU Biotech Directive, um, and for this. Um, we um, first of all have a model law um, in Austria that tried to clarify that on national level. Um, so Austria now has a national patent law that very clearly says that patents on conventional seeds are not um, patentable. Um, it includes explicitly random mutations and it explicitly um, includes natural variation of genes and also restricts the scope of patents of GMOs to the GMOs. Um, and um, this we need now ideally in more member states, but the EU also really should take the lead on ensuring that the interpretation that was intended is actually being done by the European Patent Organization. And um, it would be really great to have a strong signal from the European Parliament and also a new Commission notice to clarify the interpretation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dagmar. I know, I know it is difficult to get so much information into a few minutes, um, uh, you, but you managed to answer some questions that I wanted to ask you in the panel afterwards. So my, de my idea was to maybe skip that part and rather give the floor um, to one or two questions. We only have two or three minutes, but if you have questions on the presentation uh, that Dagmar just did, now would be your opportunity to ask them. was very clear. Good to hear. If not, um, you can always come back uh, later on and we hope that we still have time for some questions. So if something still comes up, but very well done if there are no questions. <laughs> um, so I hand over to Christoph Teen, who was already presented in the first panel and he will give us an overview about patents on CRISPR. Uh, on the slides, please. Um, Thank you very much for giving me again the floor. I try to confuse people now, really. So I try to give an overview on patents, on uh, CRISPR patents, on, on NGT patents, uh, and their impact on technology, access to technology, access to biodiversity, and uh, science, uh, independency. So um, uh, what you here see is just a collection from this biotech website, and all things you see in here can also be patented, they're all patent applications for honeybees, for fish, for cow, for tomatoes, and uh, all kinds of plants. 
Next slide. So on the um, plants issue, um, it's clear that uh, company Cortiva, which was previously um, Dow DuPont, Dow AgroSciences, Pioneer, uh, has a lead in these patent applications on the technology for, of nucleases such as CRISPR-Cas on plants. Therefore, this company can largely control the access to the technology. And European companies, small SME breeders, smaller or medium-sized breeders, uh, have, if they want to have access to the technology, uh, have to sign contracts normally with Cortiva, and there are already some companies which signed such contracts. So it's Cortiva, it's uh, leading in number not only in patent applications, but also in number of patents granted. 30 patents of these uh, international applications were already granted by the European Patent Office, and second is company Bayer. Next slide. Uh, and here you see uh, that Cotiva, what I already mentioned, has a predominant position. They have made contracts with the inventors of the CRISPR-Cas uh, gene scissors, um, and they have a large number of own patent applications. As you saw, the applications on plant, each application on plants is patented as well as the basic technology, and Cotiva uh, tries to um, control access to the technology and readers who sign. As, uh, contracts with the U.S. competition uh, company, <laughs> they will, may have access to the technology. And besides, of course, Bayer who is not being uh, so much being dependent on Corteva. They have their own patent um, portfolio. They are able to have their own contracts with the um, inventors of the gene scissors. But, um, and, and, uh, uh, which do not have this huge um, and, and really expensive machinery behind with patent lawyers to run these patent applications. They all get dependent on these bigger companies. So, uh, next slide. Um, and there we see um, the, um, oh, okay, I can do it by myself. Oh, perfect, okay. Old man, um, okay. Um, so um, we now see the patent applications filed uh, in CRISPR-Cas technology in the last two years, and there we see interesting uh, development. We see smaller companies showing up, which were always promised to us that uh, also will have more participation in the, in, the, in the technology. And there we see the company Pairwise and the company Inari filing a lot of patents in the last two years. And Pairwise, we looked into the files. This is somehow uh, not uh, easy to understand because they seem to file several patents on each um, so-called invention. So the number of patents is much higher than the number of inventions behind. So we left it aside because this was pretty unclear to us what this means. Uh, and then we took a closer look to the company of Inari, and this was really fascinating. Next slide. Um, this is a, oh, sorry, now I, oh, okay, now I have to... Um, multitask. <laughs> multitask, thanks. So uh, we see a lot of people, you cannot read it, you can read it, I don't know, um, from uh, companies like Syngenta, being now the staff personnel of Inari, Bayer and Syngenta are really well represented, ex-employees ex, um, of Bayer and Syngenta. We see a board which is composed uh, of, um, of the Buffett Foundation and the flagship pioneering investment fund, which is uh, um, also more, more or less one of the founders of these companies. So there are clearly investment interests behind. That's, that's uh, the way how they started their business. And then we see even affiliates in the strategic board like George Church and Jennifer Dowden as a Nobel Prize winner. So this is really amazing to see this company with 200 employees having all this background. And now we look what they are filing for patents and then we saw that they are filing, uh, what I now will show you the next slide, yeah, um, patents on existing biological material, what we call second-hand GE. So they take um, most of the patents uh, being filed in these last years they take uh, the old transgenic plants, which are nearly to expire in their patent protection, and then they go with the CRISPR-Cas genes into these plants and change something. So they add a new trait maybe, they change the expression of the transgenes, or they remove the transgenes. And all this leads to a new patent. So basically, these patents are um, uh, patents on existing biological material with change in some minor aspects maybe only, and in the end, we have a, a, a prolongment of uh, the, the, the patent, which normally 
lasts for 20 years. Now, uh, 20 years again, these plants will be protected by patents by this company now, which may have even co cooperation with the bigger companies. We do not know. So this is clearly not really inventive. This is a, a way how to apply CRISPR-Cas to grab a large part of the biodiversity or the biological material on the market already and monopolize it. And uh, the inventor of these patents is a patent lawyer. That's easy. It's not a, it's not a uh, scientist, mm. but the inventor is a patent lawyer. So next slide, um, I will show you. Um, uh, we also found out that CRISPR-Cas is a driver in these patents on conventional breeding. This is patents on genes, already mentioned, like Syngenta, which is going for patent application on thousands of natural occurring um, uh, polymorphism in the genome, genetic variants in the wild relative, in this case of soybeans, which are needed by all breeders, and which are also of relevance for CRISPR-Cas, because these are the target uh, sites they want to change, they want to introduce. So they try to take control on this biodiversity, no matter whether this is supposed to be used in CRISPR-Cas uh, applications or in conventional breeding. Of course, this blocks everything. And this is now summarized in here. This is why CRISPR-Cas is a driver now in patents on conventional breeding because of these many genes which are identified, which can be a target sequence for CRISPR-Cas, but also is occurring in wild relatives. And in many cases, we see that even CRISPR-Cas is not used, for, for example, in these Gencenta cases, cases, we see that Gencenta is simply doing conventional breeding and claims that they also could have done it with CRISPR-Cas. And this blocks everything. If the gene variants are patented, which are, used, which are needed by all breeders, this means the end of traditional plant breeding because without access to biological diversity, uh, this is a game over for plant uh, for, the, for, the, for the system as we have it so far. And my final aspect, uh, I also wanted to bring to your attention that these patents also have an impact on science. For example, we have this famous German report from 2019 on, uh, on, uh, from the Leopoldina, which is a highly acknowledged scientific institution in, in, in Germany. And so the experts which were writing on ri risks of CRISPR-Cas technology uh, most of them were not coming from maybe environmental sciences or, or ecological sciences. Most of them are just coming from uh, companies or, or backgrounds or institutions which file their own patents on these plants. So this, of course, impacts the uh, independence of science as well in this field because um, it's a policy also in, in research pol politics from, 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 from the government and from the commission to ask them to file these patents. And therefore, you will not find many independent patents independent experts working on these plants without having also some kind of interest in their marketing. And so the demands, the recommendations, uh, as already mentioned, the prohibitions of Article 53B, uh, which is a prohibition on the patents of plant varieties, should be enforced by interpretations. This can be done any day. This is not a change in law. It's just a change of interpretation. And then we should establish a clear distinction between genetic engineering and other breeding methods to exclude these patents on native traits, on these gene variants, randomly occurred, uh, occurring gene variants, like randomly mutated plants, etc., from those which are really technically uh, inserted into plants. And then we have to restrict the, co the scope of patents to the specific technical processes and not get, leave it to Syngenta to take all plants which are inheriting these kind of gene variants. So this would mean to save conventional breeding without a big political um, 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 agenda because this would not require a change in law. This only would require a change of interpretation of law. And this can be done by the European Patent, uh, by the European Parliament, the European Commission, and the member states of the European Union because they are the ones who opened the field of plant breeding to patents. So they can say, what they intended in 98 was this directive. And as soon as it's done, if there's a correct interpretation, we, are, we get rid of all these problems. And then we still have the CRISPR patents, uh, which would need a change in law, which might take five or ten years, I don't know. And as long as this is not solved, it should be at least written full transparency on the seed packages, not only that it's genetically engineered, but also which patents are um, on the seeds and which companies are behind. So um, I think this was it.
thank you very much and um, looking for your for your questions. questions. Thank you very much. Um, yet again, a lot of input. Um, do you have quest questions for Christoph? Either it was too overwhelming or it was very clear. I hope it was the, the second no. one. <laughs> um, yes, um, don't worry if you don't have any questions. Um, Christoph and Dagmar are still here on the panel, so feel free to uh, raise your hand later on uh, during uh, the panel discussions if there are still um, some questions arising. Um, so I would like uh, now to give the f floor to all of our panelists um, who have around five minutes each to present their input, which is quite short. Um, so I would like to keep the presentation um, and the introduction uh, uh, rather short, but feel free to add um, something in regards to your person if you think that it's uh, helpful. Um, and after we just now heard uh, the reports uh, where we see that indeed patents are being granted um, on conventional breeding and as well on CRISPR, um, I would like uh, to address um, Mr. Denise Dombois, um, who joins us from the Commission from DG Growth. He's a senior expert uh, dealing with patent uh, matters and um, um, since we already heard from the proposal of the Commission today a lot, um, I would like to now focus rather on the issue on conventional breeding, as we just heard would be something that um, could be fixed um, much easier by uh, interpretation of the law. Um, so my question would be, um, since we already have a notice from the Commission from 2016, that clearly states um, that um, conventional breeding should be excluded from patentability. How is our, your assessment today, especially hearing those reports? Are you satisfied with the implementation of this notice um, by the EPO? Or what could be possible steps forward um, to have a clear regulation to keep patents on conventional breeding out of patentability? Yes, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, to come directly to that question, um, of course, we are absolutely open to look into all of these issues. It was mentioned already by uh, Ms. Burry, and it is explicitly mentioned in the, uh, sorry, in the communication that was uh, adopted yesterday. So we are going to look into these matters very seriously, as we already did, and you rightly uh, mentioned this uh, notice uh, that was adopted in uh, 16 already, so seven years ago by the Commission because indeed uh, there were already at that time a number of issues that were maybe not totally clear uh, in the biotech directive which by the way was adopted uh, well was initial was adopted in 98 but was initially proposed about 10 years ago because the, its negotiation took about 10 years that is incredibly long but that was really very delicate very controversial etc so that's a, by the way that's a real pandora's box so uh, we are not totally uh, pushing for reopening uh, this uh, directive because um, the results might be a bit uh, unpredictable. But okay, well, if it is needed at some point, uh, we are ready to consider that, of course. But um, so uh, just to say, yeah, at that time, 98 and certainly 10 years before, that was just the beginning of the biotech revolution, let's say, and some techniques were not even present at that time, which are now causing trouble, I would say, today. So we must certainly look into that. And um, so I want to recall, it has been mentioned already also this morning, uh, I think that many of you uh, attended uh, this uh, meeting of the Agri Committee where uh, Heli Pilayama from the Open Patent Office clarified, summarized quite well the applicable rules. And, and so just to recall, uh, well, first of all, uh, everything, all discoveries, everything that is not new, so everything that is in the public domain today will remain in the public domain. So if some seeds are not patented today, they will not become patented uh, at a later point if they are already 
described or on the market. Uh, but okay, the, the main rules are that indeed plant varieties are not patentable, but that's about plant varieties. That's a very specific concept. It is not about plants in general. Uh, then, uh, pro, uh, sorry, essentially biological processes are not patentable. And then there was a sort of loophole that was addressed in the notice of 16 regarding the products obtained by these essentially biological processes. There was some unclarity and there have been uh, hesitant decisions of the uh, EPO in that respect. And this is why th these... Uh, sort of the discrepancies or uncertainties reached the enlarged Board of Appeal of the uh, EPO, which is the, the highest uh, jurisdiction at the EPO. Uh, and uh, of course, the Commission and many other stakeholders submitted arguments. Uh, and we were, of course, pleading for what is what was in this notice of 16. Uh, and the result, the end result of that uh, appeal before the enlarged board was that this rule 28.2 was confirmed to be valid and we were very happy and this rule says very clearly that uh, plants obtained by essentially biological processes are not patentable. Uh, of course, this decision for legal reason, let's say, this decision is not retroactive before uh, some date in 2017, uh, which means that for uh, more, ancient, more ancient uh, applications, uh, well, it may happen, unfortunately, I, I regret it, but well, uh, it is like that, uh, that some patents, a small number of patents might still be granted uh, despite this Rule 28.2. Uh, however, uh, the biotech directive is also applicable at a national level. And so uh, it is, uh, of course, it would be feasible to challenge the grant of any national patent resulting from such a European patent before a national court. Um, so then I, I know there is a lot of concern regarding products that could be obtained both by a natural process, conventional breeding process, or by a technical process. Uh, and indeed, I know this is um, maybe a bit uh, tricky, but it also, uh, this is a problem that also arises in other sectors. For example, if you, if you have a patent on the, um, on, the, on the product obtained by a certain process, well, if I see on the market a, a sample, a box, a, a pot of this product, uh, I cannot say whether it infringes the patent or not. It depends which process was used to manufacture the product. If it was the patented product, of course, uh, the patented process, of course, there is an infringement of the patent. But if the manufacturer can demonstrate that he used a different, unpatented process, well, the product is not infringing. Well, we may have the same situation with some plants. I, I can understand that this is a bit uncomfortable, um, but well, this is not unique to this sector. And most importantly, uh, in the patent, if you, if, we have, if you have a patent on um, such a plant that could be obtained both by technical and non-technical uh, process, there is a requirement, the EPO requires before granting the patent that the, claim, the claims specifically include a disclaimer clarifying that the variant of the plant obtained by a technical process is the only thing that is patented. So the, the claims must exclude uh, the variant which is obtained by conventional processes. And the, the EPO insist, uh, insists very strongly uh, on that. Um, and well, as you have said, the, the EPO, in fact, the European Patent Organization included quite rapidly the main rules of the Biotech Directive into the uh, European Patent Convention, which is very nice, although, the, again, the, the European Patent Organization is not a EU institution, but they have rules 
And again, uh, amongst the 39 contracting states of that organization, 27 are member states of the European Union. So we still have a majority in, in any organ like the Administrative Council or the Patent Law Committee, etc. The EU member states have a majority, which is, of course, uh, useful uh, to when we try to pass our ideas and in particular the, the interpretation of the biotech directive. So I would think I will stop here because we are lacking time, but of course I, I'm available for further questions. Yes, thank you very much. I already noticed a question <laughs> from Christoph Thien on, on my right. You said that also in other sectors you have a problem with something which might be patented or not uh, due to the process, but you only have on plants and animals, it's the only sector where you have Article 53B, and Article 53B prohibits plant and pl uh, on, uh, patents on plant varieties. And now you see that 1,200 conventional bread varieties are already being, um, how do you say, uh, comprised or, 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 consider, or, or concerned by patents. How can you be satisfied with the situation? This is completely against the law. And if, if you set aside Article 53B, we completely agree. There is no legal barrier. But Article 53B is valid. It's in the EPC. And, uh, and uh, as you correctly mentioned, as, uh, when the patent directive came in, it was only about the beginning of biotechnology. And now these patents are being expanded to conventional breeding. And this was a little bit ignored, I think, by your statement. You just repeated what we hear since 20 years. Sorry for that. Yeah, but uh, the, so uh, Article 53, yeah. uh, Article 53 uh, does not exclude the patentability of all plants. That, that is not what it is doing. Uh, this article excludes, uh, first, plant varieties. But again, as I mentioned, plant varieties has a very specific meaning. It's not, it's not a synonym of plants. It's something very, very specific. Yeah, please, please, please look to this report we, we, we mm -hmm. published. We try to explain that the KWAS, for example, the maize, from a plant breeder's perspective, as it is described, and also according to the EPC, this is clearly a plant variety because it can is distinct. It, it's an, it, it, it can be uh, inherited to the next generations, and therefore it completely fulfills the definition of a plant variety as given in the European Patent Convention. The only way to escape this if you patent a technology which can be used on several plant varieties. But this is not the case here. This is normal plant breeding, and it's a plant variety which is a result of a nevertheless patent was granted. Well, that is possible. I don't know that specific patent, uh, but again, uh, we, we should not. We should make it clear to, to everybody in the room that the, the European Patent Convention does not exclude, by by principle, the patentability of all plants, but plant varieties, plants obtained by essentially biological processes, and these processes, as such, uh, of course. Yes, so I believe this is a, a difficult debate, but what can be concluded is that in, re in the assessment from no patents on seeds, we see that there are clear legal provisions that are not being respected, to put it easy. Um, so at least from our perspective, it should be a problem that can be quite uh, easily solved. Let's see um, if we um, make some progress um, today, um, but uh, I would like to introduce as well the other panelists um, to give us their input uh, and maybe to switch from the rather legal background. Um, I think it is as well very interesting to hear how we see um, those uh, rather technical legal provisions um, affect uh, uh, the daily lives of breeders and as an effect um, of all of us as a society as we we see um, our food system um, threatened. Um, so I would like to uh, introduce Franz Carré, who is a breeder from the Netherlands, who's joining us today. Um, he's working for the Bolster Organic Seeds, so they are a breeding company uh, working on different uh, crops for the organic market. Uh, and just to mention as well that from uh, we already heard from the Austrian changed patent law as well in the Netherlands. Uh, there was opposition against the current practice on granting patents on conventional breeding. So there was as well a resolution from the Dutch parliament. 
Um, and uh, I would like to ask you now, as a breeder who's working in this field on a daily basis, how you um, see your work affected by it and what uh, your concerns are for the future. Well, thank you very much for this uh, invitation to speak at this uh, event. Um, so I'm, I'm working for a small independent Dutch breeding company, um, working on uh, vegetables, herbs, flowers and cover crops in the organic market. And uh, yeah, we started 15 years ago breeding and we now have a portfolio of 370 varieties uh, varying from hybrids, open pollinated varieties, but also old land races. And we sell it world, worldwide uh, to our professional growers, uh, all around growers, but also to the consumer market. Um, and yeah, we work as an organic company uh, in, with traditional breeding methods, um, uh, which means uh, uh, we we've develop uh, varieties that must contribute to sustainable um, farming on the principles of uh, health, ecology, fairness and care. And our breeding work is done without chemicals, synthetic fertilizers, but also we want to keep our portfolio free of patents and GMOs, because that's what our uh, customers ask for. Yeah, our customers uh, are also the organic growers. Um, now, yeah, the use of patents on plant characteristics is, is, is not helping uh, developing better varieties. Uh, what you see is that it gives power over the genes to a few big companies. And we believe that breeding must stay feasible for everybody and not to be inhibited by ownership of natural traits by single companies. Um, if patents keep being granted uh, and we don't invest in uh, patents, then yeah, our, uh, our, uh, 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 we will, won't be able to breed anymore uh, because every single gene can be, that can be of interest will be patented and it will be impossible to make varieties without patents. Um, and we think, yeah, the breeder rights are dealt with very well uh, in the plant variety protection system of the CPVO. And yeah, a good example, which is already meant uh, by, by Dagmar, um, is the tomato patent on, uh, on the tomato brown rugose fruit virus. Uh, you already see 10, it's even now 12 or four, 14 patents being, ground, uh, being uh, applied. Um, and that, that means that for us now, uh, when we find a new uh, resistance, we first have to check with all these patents, is our gene that we found uh, listed in one of these patents. So it, it gets very complex and you can imagine this is only one uh, gene, there's only one resistance and this will happen with tens or hundreds of different patents. And yeah, that means that yeah, we, we don't need any breeders anymore, but we need uh, a whole legal department to check all this. Uh, and yeah, in the end, we don't think this is any, that this won't help us because when there are so many patents, um, everybody wants part of the, of the pie in the end. If, if I have a, a variety with 10 patents in there, I have to pay to 10 companies part of, of our profits. And it starts with one patent, but it, in the end, we will have hundreds of patents, I think. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not helping uh, the development of new varieties. Um, and we think it will put a stop on innovation. Uh, there will be innovation in finding patents and, uh, and finding genes that you can be patented, but not in making the hybrids uh, or, uh, that, the, uh, that the growers want. So there, there will be a lot of companies that just make uh, patents and um, live of the profits of these patents. And it doesn't matter that they uh, make the varieties. Um, and I think if the patents keep on uh, plants keep being granted, that companies like the Bolster will disappear. And there are a lot of companies like us who provide a solution for local growers and are vital for biodiversity, um, opposed to the monocultures. Um, and these companies, we don't have the means to invest in market technology, sequencing and, and big legal departments, um, but will be inundated by all these patents. And yeah, I think it's very strange also that the big European plant breeding companies uh, like, like Bayo, x uh, Enza, together with Plantum are also very quiet on this topic at this moment. They were very uh, much involved uh, in 2017 with, uh, against patents and now you don't hear about them anymore. And I think 
it's because they foresee a big future in patents in combination with the new genomic techniques. Um, yeah, CRISPR-Cas is seen as an as a inventive step by the European Plant uh, Patent Office. Um, and I, I think, therefore, they think with these new uh, techniques, we can file a lot of new patents and yeah, then take over the market. So, yeah, my conclusion is, yeah, is it preferable situation that the power over our food is laid in the hands of a couple of big companies? And do we really think and have to believe that the companies that cause the problems with monocultures and pesticide use and a declining biodiversity will now come with a solution for these problems? Uh, um, eh? And who will benefit from patents? Will it be the food uh, security, the small companies, or will it be the big agri-tech companies? Um, and yeah, you can ask yourself, is this a good solution for the common people of the European Union? Um, and I hope we can keep Europe as a place where we choose our own path and invest in sustainable solutions that benefit everybody. And companies like the Bolster are part of this solution, and we want to stay part of that. I thank you very much for your uh, time. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask uh, Eric Gall, um, the uh, Deputy Director and Policy Manager of IFORM uh, Organics Europe, uh, to follow up on that. There was a recent open letter by IFORM and many other organizations um, addressed to the European Ministers and Agriculture and to the Commission as well, raising uh, concerns about uh, patents. Um, on new GMO, but as well on conventional breeding. Um, how do you see especially the organic sector affected by the recent develop, uh, developments? Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, without losing sight of a bigger picture, I would first like to give credit to the European Commission for listening to the majority of views within the organic movement and make it clear, at least in their proposal, that NGTs should be banned from organic production because it's indeed very important for the organic movement, uh, which has taken a position at the global level, at the European level, that these NGTs uh, should not be used in organic production. But if we go back to the bigger picture, of course, I mean, this proposal is still a massive step backward for biosafety, for consumer information, and for a possibility <laughs> of organic operators to, uh, to uh, keep their promise and commitment that no genetic engineering is used in the organic production process. And that's a message I would like to, as so uh, members of the parliament to, 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 to keep in mind, you know. The organic sector is clearly committed to keeping NGTs out of organic, but operators and farmers need to have uh, practical and legal means to fulfill this commitment. This means we need full traceability and consumer labeling for all these NGTs, including category one NGTs. So why is the organic movement opposed to, to NGTs? I mean, of course, there are scientific reasons and not only philosophical reasons like we hear sometimes. Uh, you know, we believe in the precautionary principle. We know that contrary to what the NGT proposal says, you know, um, uh, there are dozens of unintended effects when you use genetic engineering processes and that if you look beyond only you know the, the mutation that you're trying to achieve which can be similar to what can be achieved by conventional breedings if you take into account all these unintended effects clearly these plants, these plants are not identical to to what you can achieve through conventional breedings but there are other reasons as well which are clearly linked to the acknowledgement that any technology, you know, can have social, economic and political effects uh, as well. And very clearly, the organic movement defends a model of breeding which is based on, on uh, participatory breeding uh, as much as possible to uh, using diversity and agrobiodiversity, and which is clearly based on the free circulation and exchange of genetic material. And this is what the, the European model of innovation is based on. Uh, as well. I know that our comrades from Via Campesina don't like us mentioning uh, uh, plant variety rights, and they are right because they don't change anything for farmers, but at least from a legal point of view, they are a breeder to use genetic material which is protected to make a new creation. I always uh, uh, enjoy talking to breeders because they usually take very interesting comparison. Uh, you know, they, they compare genes to musical notes, you know, and they say, you know, you should not pay the musical notes. Or 
they also say, you know, when, when companies like Monsanto arrive, you know, it's as if they, they had a property on a chair and they put the chair to, into your house and then suddenly they claim property over your whole house. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting on how these examples really show very clearly that the whole point of doing genetic engineering in the first place was to legitimate very strong intellectual property rights on living beings and in pushing you know, forward the frontier of capitalism into living beings uh, themselves, uh, basically. Uh, I think the first companies that Monsanto approached back in the late 80s and 90s, you know, with their license on herbicide tolerant crops, they were not interested in buying it. And that's why Monsanto started buying seed companies uh, as well, and why all these biotech companies started buying seed companies, is because they need to have the good varieties in which to put their patented genes to get property over, over the, the, the variety themselves. But the, interesting, the, the added value of a variety very often was achieved by conventional breeding, by good old crossing of different varieties and, and patient breeding work. And the only added value of this genetic engineering process is to ensure that these companies get a, a monopoly right uh, uh, through the patents, and we should keep that in mind, and this is what the organic movement uh, keeps in mind uh, as well. So uh, I will not speak for, for too long, but just to, to say very clearly that the organic movement fully subscribed to, to the visions that was presented by, uh, uh, by many speakers before, and we do expect the European Commission to take action to ensure that natural traits and genetic material that can be obtained through conventional breeding or exist in nature is protected from patents and that no patent on genetic engineering or on processes should ever cover such genetic material. Otherwise, otherwise very clearly, uh, it will completely destroy the European model of breeding, which, like it was said, uh, uh, is rich of hundreds of small and medium-sized enterprises. I think we all know in this rule that who control the seed, control food production, uh, so it's not a, a, a light issue or, or, or a small legal issue. I think it's really about ensuring that the European Union and, and Europeans, we remain a, a, a sovereign into how we decide to, to produce food and to, and, to, and to produce it as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it has been made very clear what the impacts um, would be um, if we don't find a good solution. So we are now very curious to hear from our members of Parliament. Um, there have been resolutions um, in the past by the European Parliament clearly stating that they are opposed to patents on conventional breeding. Um, and um, just to say that the citizens are as well opposed to patents. There have been petitions in the past that have been signed by hundreds of thousands of Europeans. So it would be very important to have their in, uh, interest in mind as well. Um, so I would like to first address um, Mr. Benoit Pitot and um, ask him what his proposal would be to move forward. Hello, merci déjà. Thank you very much. Thank you for organising this event and thank you very much for giving me the floor. I'm not sure whether I'll have all of the proposals and to resolve this issue this afternoon, but I would like to draw the Commission's attention in particular to the fact that this debate and this discussion now is starting off from a very biased position. And it's, this is saying that people with new technologies and uh, new solutions are going to bring solutions to a problem that has not been resolved yet. That's what they would say. And the, 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 the failure in that reasoning is the fact that farmers know how to breed crops that are resistant to um, droughts, for example, much these solutions are much quicker than technology-based solutions. These uh, small-scale farmers have um, responses to um, to these problems, and because they've worked on those solutions, they have found their own seed sovereignty. 
And because we don't talk about that aspect, we come up with all kinds of regulations and science and technology-based solutions. The worst thing about all of that is that once all of these technologies have been implemented and once the legal conditions have been established to uh, provide for these technical solutions, those under threat will be farmers themselves who for generations have been able to find solutions to the challenges um, historical challenges, whether it's climate change, uh, health preservation, or the preservation of biodiversity. And I would uh, like to highlight what you were saying, Mr. Carey. If we see the uh, lack of genetic resources, it's because these people have got involved and because these people don't know what to do about food uh, sovereignty, and about feeding people, all they are thinking about is uh, finance and uh, short-term profits from seeds. And I think I think uh, Vanya Beek once said that those who have seeds have all the power in the world. So what we are actually doing is we are looking at regulations and we are um, giving the power to these people who are really causing the problems of biodiversity. And as I say, we've got these challenges to face. I am very worried about what is happening. I'm very concerned at the Commission's attitude. Clearly, the Commission wanted to listen to those people rather than farmers who have the answers. So really, they are trying to fight, find solutions that already exist. And I'd like to uh, quote Einstein. It's you won't find the solution with those who are causing the problem. Thank you. I give the word to Maria Arena. Merci beaucoup. Je vais pas être très... Thank you. What I'm going to say won't be far off what's just said. I'm learning a lot. Now, I work for the S&D on a file on reducing pesticide use. What the Commission has put forward on NGTs, that report will be given to someone and I hope to work on it within my group because it's going to be a tough fight. We're already having a tough battle on our hands with this issue of pesticide use reduction. Because you might be a progressive and, you know, you're a progressive who's in favour of science, but there's scientific independence and then there's also those who have been bought within the scientific community. So there are, there's this issue of those who are progressives in favour of science and then there are those who are they're pitted against those who are conservative in terms of uh, seed conservation. But actually, I think it's not like that at all. It was not the progressives who opposed the nature restoration law. It was the conservatives. The progressives are not against a drop in pesticide use. No, it was the conservatives. The progressives are not against the Green Deal and moving it forward. The Conservatives are against it. So let's be clear. We do have to apply the principle of precaution. We do need time. That doesn't mean we're anti-tech. It means that we have to ask, why has the NGT proposal come forward today. Well, it's a way of saying to the pesticide company, 
Well, U.S. pesticide companies, you can continue to produce, uh, but in exchange, you have to use less, but you can use NVTs. Now, where's Martin Häusling gone? He's gone. Now, there are countries where they can use NGTs, and there's been no drop in pesticide use. So these companies are going to win twice over. These companies are going to continue to produce pesticides, and they will have a monopoly on seed and a monopoly on any alternative. Then let's look at the commission. In the commission, they say, we're going to protect the organic sector. That's wrong. They're going to protect organic by not involving organic in category one. But it, what they're putting forward will prevent the organic sector from really existing. What they're proposing will prevent there from being alternatives. So they say that you can choose to opt out of these technologies. It's not true. We, in these in the European Parliament, need to do some work explaining what's going on. I think that the Commission proposal is baseless. We need to look at the sure regulation. We need to ensure that pesticides are used less. We need to promote alternatives. We also need time to look at these NBTs and to see what's on our plate in the Parliament, served to us by the Commission. So we mustn't be hasty with the legislation that's being put forward. Now I admit, my group is not unanimous. What I'm saying is not unanimously shared by the rest of my group. And it's not the first time that there are disagreements within a group. The aim is to get as many people on side as possible. Hopefully we can create a majority within the parliament. You know, an enlightened majority. Not of not a parliament where we have so-called progressives against so-called conservatives. Uh, thank you very much. I believe we need the hand mic right now um, for the closing words of Thomas Weyer. Ah, well, he knows how to help himself. Um, so the closing words um, go to Thomas Weitz. I think one thing is clear. Industry has learned their lessons from the big defeat we gave them in the 90s. So they have framed new narratives. It's not genetical modification and organisms. It's new breeding techniques. It's, it's, it's now today they come up with species where they try to at least pretend that this could be of some use in terms of, well, less pesticide use or more drought resistance, uh, which we, if, we, if we see the concrete examples, it's not really reflected in the amount of patents that are already given and in the amount of species uh, that are already out there. The, the uh, industry has also done their homeworks. We can see that in many environmental movements. Even in the climate movement, I, young people are approaching me and saying, uh, Thomas, you know, you, you really need to get these NGTs going because they're going to save our food supply in difficult climate uh, times. So with this proposal, there's a lot of new public attention on this case again, which offers an opportunity to us to revitalize the debate that we're having. I mean, one thing is clear, genetically modified organisms and biodiversity, this is a contradiction within. We've heard there's brassica uh, um, uh, applications. Brassica has a lot of wild relatives. So cross-pollination to wild plants cannot be uh, 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 securely uh, ruled out. It's going to happen. So biodiversity and NGTs will not work together. What we also need to make clear is that what we're against is putting these organisms out into nature. An argument of industry is very often, okay, these people, they're against technological progress. We're not against technological progress as long as you use dangerous technologies in the right environment. So in closed bioreactors, may it be to produce medicines, may it be to produce other, other substances. Uh, I mean, you, we, you, can, you can have doubts on that. But you see, we're not against genetical knowledge about genetical dispositions. You could actually speed up classical uh, um, breeding processes by sequencing, 
by actually knowing uh, what you need to look at and to see where you do the, where you reach the changes that you were intending to. But for this kind of techniques, you can never apply a patent. And that's what it is actually about, that the Commission comes with a proposal that is not clarifying the question on patents, is actually, I mean, this is a real downside of this proposal. Uh, to say, well, let's talk about patents until 2026. No, if it's not clarified that there cannot be any patents on so-called close to nature or kind of natural organisms, then this whole uh, file, I think, will fail. I mean, on one hand, the, uh, the industry uh, argues, well, it's, it's actually like natural. There's no difference. You can't even uh, um, prove the difference. So why should we have any restrictions on putting it on the market? And at the same time, they're asking for patents and patents granted on a technological intervention. So there's a contradiction uh, within. Also for the organic sector, if there's no labeling anymore, uh, yes, you have a seed, a seed labeling in the first round. But then if, if, the, if the seeds are reused, if they're replanted, it's getting totally blurry. So getting NGTs out in the nature would mean the end of GMO-free uh, organic agriculture. But it's not just organic. We've heard today the representative of, of the food processing industry, uh, and we've heard that a lot of citizens want to have a choice. It's about transparency, it's about transparency for citizens, it's about the freedom of choice. And, you know, these companies, the food, food processors, I mean, they know what their consumers are sensitive on, and that's why they want clear labeling. So it's not just the organic sector, it's also the conventional sector that has decided to be GMO free, that is directly under attack uh, by this regulation. So what did I forget? Uh, yes, uh, last but not least, I mean, a lot has been said already. Uh, and, and so I, I will not repeat all of this. But basically, now is the time to reunite in this battle against the new approach of liberalization of GMOs out there. I think it's important that, well, we in the parliament, we need to do a proper job, but it's also like rejoining forces with civil society, rejoining forces also with other societal actors that helped us a lot in the 90s uh, uh, in, in pushing back, which was churches, which was labor organizations, which was consumer organizations. So to rebuild this big alliance, to stop that liberalization, to stop this genetically modified organisms being spread all over Europe without any control, without any transparency, without any labeling, and without any concrete security measures uh, to, to limit the potential damage that we can see here. And I think uh, this is what I want to thank you for, that you attended this meeting here today, this conference here today. All of you, the speakers, uh, the guests, everyone online that joined us here. Uh, the proposal came yesterday. The first unification attempt comes one day later. So I think we're really in time. Uh, and and let's, let's rejoin forces. And I think this is a regulation that we will be able to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we learned um, there's a lot at stake at the moment. We heard of many good solutions to go forward. So I hope that this uh, discussion helped us to do so. And um, we will now um, close this meeting. Uh, thank you to all who participated and to our panelists. Thank you. And thank you very much to the translator the interpretation, of course. Thank <laughs> you.